One, two, one. Okay, yeah, so guys, just so, you, um, yeah, as ever, to try and turn this into a teaching moment. The problem we're having here is something called uh, digital, right for digital rights management, DRM. So you would have come across DRM in your everyday lives probably without realizing it. It's essentially uh, a, 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 where you take a digital signal and you try and pass a, a bit of copyrighted material from one place to another. And what's happening is the, the computer, for some reason, is triggering its digital rights protection and it's basically not allowing us to show you what we want to show you. Um, and essentially, the reason that Apple and computer manufacturers include DRM systems is so that you can't rip DVDs and rip Blu-rays and that kind of thing. So we're having a little technical issue. It worked absolutely fine yesterday. Um, we tried it several times. But uh, as ever with technical stuff, sometimes, um, yeah, there's little glitches. So uh, we're getting there. One, two, one, two. One, two, one, two, yeah. So, okay, good. So, guys, we, it looks like we're pretty much ready to go. Um, so, g give you a bit of context. Um, trying to get to... One, two. So, uh, yeah, so uh, to give you a bit of context, um, Ari was one of my students um, a few years ago. What, when did you graduate? Two, three years ago? three years ago, and uh, he went off and uh, got progressively more into other things. You know, like, we're always talking about you having, like, alternative skill sets and things that you're kind of interested in. He had a passion, I guess, for music, and, and you were doing, like, spoken word stuff. Yeah. I think you were doing loads of stuff that kind of took him on a different direction, and um, we bumped into each other. I was walking the dog. I think you were just coming out of, a, like, a meet his girlfriend or whatever. <laughs> and we were just saying, you know, wouldn't it be great to, uh, to come in and do, do something here? Now, inevitably, like, over the years at UEL, what, what's one of the amazing things about UEL is there's always a lot of students that are kind of interested in music. Generally, it's a kind of a really interesting medium uh, as creativity. So these guys, there's uh, three of them. These guys are Connect Studios. Is that... How you pronounce those? And uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, but um, yeah, that's the connection. So they're sort of alumni, or Ari is an alumni of UEL, and uh, they run a little uh, studio, or a big studio, ambitious kind of plans. So uh, yeah, it's entrepreneurial and all those other things that we like to talk about. So uh, yeah, Thank you, thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Arian Mometi. Thank you, Dan, for that amazing introduction. Um, I'm not sure what everyone studies here, if it's graphic design or whatever you study, but um, as you said, the syllabus definitely, definitely approaches itself in a way where just, just lends itself to different mediums and different formats of art, and I think that's so important when you're going off and to whatever direction you're trying to take and want to achieve, um, life will throw curveballs at you, and sometimes you're gonna have to switch lanes and do different things, but that's why graphic design here was so important and beneficial because it just taught you about music, uh, you taught you about vintage, retro, taught you about culture, taught you about film, taught you about music, everything, everything combined into one. And, and yeah, sorry, I'm so used to holding these things up. Anyway, so I left university and it was graphic design for a period of time. Um, I kind of went towards cover arts and, and, and creating different forms for, of mediums for different artists and, and filmmakers. And I went off to Dubai after that shortly and I, and I was doing a lot of uh, filming work out there. Um, that's really what led me into music. It was really that initial period. Um, after doing a syllabus here in, 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 Connect, in uh, not Connect, in UEL, uh, we did a, a music kind of, it was like a music themed lecture and we had to create a song between us all as a group. And um, I think that was the initial starting point to really take this 
career more seriously. Um, so I, I went out into the world. I met Sultan, who was the first ever engineer and producer I'd ever worked with. And um, I stuck by him because he was the one, the only person I really knew at the time who, who was doing that type of thing. And two, I really enjoy building with someone and as opposed to just going everywhere that I can, trying to do what I can. I like to create a home somewhere and, and, and build from there a structure. Um, so that's where I met Sultan. And then I got more into knowing him and learning about music. And then he gave me a call one day and he said, hey, man, um, me and Lucas, we need a, we need a logo done for the studio. We have, we have a, a recording studio we want to start up. And it's called Connect Studios. Can you, can you please help us out? Um, can we go into the next slide? If it works. <laughs> this is them two back to back. Um, Lucas had shaved his head bald at that time, and, and Sultan was definitely a martial artist. Um, go to the next slide for me. We began the journey literally looking for a location at first. Um, before I'd even started, well, after I'd started doing the logo stuff and really trying to create this image and branding behind Connect Studios. Um, it was all about trying to find a space and, and create a home for Connect Studios. This was the first one we looked at. Um, it was at, um, where was it again, Bermondsey? Yeah, it was underneath literally a gym, and, but it just, it wasn't, it wasn't to our, what we needed at the time. It was too big, too wide, too underground, too low, the ceiling literally you can see by their heads. It's nearly reaching the top. Um, let's go to the next one. Yeah, so we went through various different spaces looking for the perfect place to start Connect Studios, and we, we, it was all good. It was all beautiful, um, big spaces. This is us. Um, yeah, play it through. Oh, it's not that empty? Oh, right, okay, that's cool. That's cool. We have to back it up and print it out as a PDF. Um, but we had all our stuff in storage at first, and we, we really wanted to start the studio, and we, we had a, a real big help in hand. Um, from Lucas's family who run a company in, in, in Poland. Would you like to give a brief? Yeah, so, hello everyone, my name is Lucas Tomaszewski, I'm from Poland, and thanks for uh, allowing us to speak with you guys today. Um, so yeah, basically, um, I, I have a, a building company in Poland, and we, we just had means to organize the whole transport and all, and all the materials to, to come to London and make that uh, you know, a little bit cheaper for us. We're, we're trying to cut the cost as much as possible. So a lot of those materials were actually coming from outside of the country. And um, at the time, it was a little bit easier because right now, because of the whole Brexit, uh, moving stuff across the border is a little bit more difficult. So we kind of got lucky uh, when it comes to that. Uh, this is how the space used to look like before we even started working on it. Um, the, the team of builders were literally sleeping at the spot for uh, around two months. And um, yeah, we just we banged it out. It used to be one big room. And um, yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of materials and stuff that went into it. We've built a whole soundproofing around the studio. We've built two rooms out of one big room. Uh, so we had metal framing, uh, soundproofing rock wool. Um, we have that glass in between two rooms so we can see the person on the other side, and uh, yeah, we just thought that this place is probably, it's, it's not ideal, but we kind of had to um, make that final decision, because we so, we've seen so many spaces that, uh, yeah, that was, that was probably our best choice. Um, so yeah, that, that's our wall. Uh, that's the rock wall in the, in the wall. That's, what, what are you doing there? Um, that's, um, like I said, that was one big space, and we made two rooms out of that. Uh, go to the next slide, and the next one. And this is the final result of our studio. Um, you know, fully soundproof, acoustically treated. Uh, we have uh, some nice toys that we brought in with us today um, that we're gonna show you. Um, so right now we're gonna talk a little bit about like studio life, uh, psychology behind being an artist, um, and stuff like that. And later on we're gonna, we're gonna go into more technical stuff just so you guys have some sort of foundation if uh, you are in a situation where you have to record something or you're in a studio, um, just so you have an idea what to use, what not to use, and, and so on. No, so uh, just out of curiosity, like how many of you guys here want to be like an artist or is it like, uh, like who, who, who wants to do music kind of? Uh. <laughs> just one person? None of you guys want to do music? Okay. Metal fan as well. Yeah, let's see. 
So yeah, this is, uh, like we said, we divided the room into two uh, halves. Uh, this is the, uh, what's a live room, so this is where we do majority of our recording. Um, the booth is in there, so it's like that's isolated as well, so we get a dead sound, and uh, Lucas is gonna go further on about talking about mics and stuff like that. So this is how it all started. When I was talking about the logo that the guys asked me to do, I, I literally, I wasn't the greatest graphic designer at first. I wasn't like, I didn't come out of this uni with great skill set in that sense. The, the whole, for me, the syllabus taught me about mindset, a psychology behind everything that we think about. You know, when we, when we think about branding, when we think about imagery, when we think about storyline, that's what I came out with. I came out with the uh, important stuff. The skill sets, it comes after. Uh, you can really work and chisel your way towards that. But the, the, the fundamentals, I think, is the psychology behind everything. Like what, what processes your brain to think about some, an idea. Like there's always a why and a reason behind it. The guys at the time wanted a cartoon design. And so I thought, okay, let me draw something, scan it in. I even, the plug sockets that you see here, I literally just traced that off a, off a JPEG. Like I just, it was just a botch job, really, if I'm honest with you. I just did what I could to get, to get them a product. I didn't take any payment for it. I said, I don't want any money for this. I'd rather have a studio session. And so I took a, I took a studio time for free. Upon doing that, I got more involved with the guys, more filming. I utilized a skill set that I did build up at UAL to film and create graphics and different imagery for them in exchange for something that I was really passionate about. So it's always like an exchange in this life. You have to do something in, a, in order to retrieve the other or trans, transfer an energy into another energy to get that the most out of it or to make it something that you, you're really into. And now this is the, the official logo and the official things that, we, that we're using. Um, Involved Sound is, is a sister company of ours. Um, that does a lot of beats and, and, and instrumentals and focuses on mixing, mastering, artist development. Connect Studios is the physical shell where everything is recorded, the technicals happen. You know, we go, that's why we have the isolation booth, the room within a room. That's, that's the core. And then around it, you have everything that happens. Um, these are some of the people that have come to our studio, uh, different faces, different, different mediums, different styles. Um, yeah, we, we, we try to make it a spaceship vibe, you know, with the LED lights and give them ambiance. The rooms have Google, Google kind of leading the way. You can ask it to change the lights to green, purple, yellow, whatever you want. Um, we also have a, you can't really tell, but back here there's a shutter, like a soundproofing shutter as well. And then within that, we also have padding that we can lift up into it. Um, I think it's also important to, to say that with this recording studio, we didn't just jump into a room and we really got lucky. Like, it was really, really, we searched around for ages. It was like, luck is another form of the universe. At the end of the day, it's not just, it doesn't just happen, you're just lucky. Like, you really work towards it for luck to happen. And that's what happened. That we were looking and looking and looking and looking and eventually found this advert on Gumtree, come, come to this space at Excelsior Studios, went there, met this amazing person called Johnny, who's a landlord. And a lot of the times, you don't get the opportunity to speak directly to the landlord. So he gave us a real, real golden opportunity to join somewhere and get a lease going. And that's another thing. When it, if you're starting a business, if you're starting something that involves contracts, you really got to put your your time into that part because you could really screw yourself over there. That's where when we got our lease, we made sure that it said we are a recording studio in this premises and we we're gonna make X amount of noise because anyone at the end of the day, you know, as, as friendly as landlords are, they could just turn around and be like, look, um, you're making too much noise. We, we didn't agree to that sort of thing, but because we had put it in writing, we said exactly what we want and slated it out from the beginning. Truth, being, being truthful is the key component to everything and have it all in writing, um, so. And I think yeah. also the most important part is like, uh, you know, taking the time to find the location because, you know, you want to set yourself in a good foundation in the first place. So it, it, it's, as soon as you get the right location, then you, you can actually plan properly. You don't want to rush into things. Because like Arian said, before we even got there, we ended up, certain, like, we, we went through like eight different places. You know, one is underneath the gym. Obviously, the gym situation can't work because there's a lot of noise that was happening upstairs. Then. Well, what, what other places did we go? We went to Wood Green, and yeah. there was other studios there. So, like, you know, it's important to plan, and a recording studio is about capturing sound as clear as possible. And, you know, it was very important, like, getting a good location, quiet location, somewhere that we can build upon. And again, that, that's the whole purpose of a business. You want to build so that your future is easier. You don't want to, you know, get yourself uh, in a bad contract or in a, in a, uh, in a bad situation. So just uh, keep that in mind. If anyone, for instance, like with you guys, you might want to not open necessarily a recording studio. You might want to open up, uh, I don't know, like a video uh, a production house. 
and with that, you know, it's important to you know make sure that your foundation is is, is strong, and your core is strong from the team, from the location, from the people that you work with, from the building that you work. So uh, yeah, that's that's very important. For then, what was this for? No, we'll do that maybe sort of a bit later. Thank you. Let's go back. All right. So when I was studying here, I, I did a for my third year. I did a film called Pufferfish, and that was um, my final major project basically. And, and I directed a short film. I wrote it, produced it, funded it. Um, it was a lot at the time. It's like it's quite like corny when you think about it now. It's just like doing everything you out all yourself is a bit. Bit of a ball ache. You don't want to be seen as someone who's an all rounder at the end of the day. The world wants specialists. Like, yes, being all around is good to know fundamentals. I think that's what's led me here. You know, I get to, I get to understand what uh, the director needs behind the screen because I've been there. I've directed something, I've filmed it, and I know what I expect from my actors. I started off acting, so I know what the directors and cameras want from me. And then when you transition that into music and channel it, and you look at me now, it's just encompassing all the aspects that I've already studied or, or done or been involved in. And I think that's important with the, whatever you're doing. All the things that you, you're, you're doing now, they're not lost or wasted. They're all transferable. And that's, 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 that's something that we always speak about when we, when we talk about careers, like transferable skill sets. Um, but it's very important, I think, to understand that with everything that we've got going on now, we can use in whatever we've got going on in, in 10 years from now and 20 years from now. You're doing that as a manifesto, no problem. This is all the cover arts that I started um, doing way before I'd even I had like five years or three years going in, and this is more of them now. So I've gotten a lot better, as you can see, my style's progressed, and I play around with hues a lot, and try and get that kind of painted feel out of something um, galactic. And yeah, I like to mess around with the colors a lot. And that's me as a child, dancing and, and enjoying myself, and this is me now, and back, back here. And this is the studio. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot of processes, go back. Yeah, so when I, when I speak about the psychology of, of an artist, of artistry, um, I think there's a lot of components within that. I think a lot of them come to do with perspective. What's your vision of the world? How do you see the world? Now what's the next one? It's, your, it's all your emotional balances, what you're going on at home. That could be what you feel to your lover. It could, there's so many things that come to a human psyche when it comes to creating something. As a human being, like, it all starts with a thought process. Our thoughts materialize into the things around us. You know, we think something, we wish something, we pray to something, we speak into the world. Like, we have such strong assets that we've been given to create. Like, we are spiritual beings at the end of the day, and this is a human experience. And when I, when I say that, I mean everything around us is materials, but they're all atoms. We're all made of the same components. And what's the next one? Influences, consciousness versus subconscious. Yeah, these are, I don't want to get so heavily into it, but for me, when it comes to music and writing, especially, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. It's very hectic and very compressed because you're talking about being very like, yeah, just like releasing everything that you have going on in your mind or everything you physically experienced and, and not even putting it down on paper. Most of the time, I don't really write music, if I'm honest. I just go just straight onto the, to the mic and, and explore the beat as I go. A lot of the time you'll, you'll, you'll know when music is talking to you because you'll just think of words, you'll think of patterns, you'll think of visions and, and, and yeah, it's, it gets very, very heavy. I think the artistry process, I think it's the same with anything from, from painting to filmmaking. Um, it's a lot of your storyline and structures that you've got within you coming out onto a format. Um, I don't want to talk too much on this right now. I think I'm just going to go straight to the end there. I want to let Lucas start getting into his technical aspects. I think that's what um, part of this recording studio is. It's, that's the important parts of this recording studio. I think a lot of the time, artistry is very heavy. Um, it's very, um, very complex. And even standing on this stage right now, I feel very like uh, vulnerable because yeah, it's been a while since I've spoken to a group of people, if I'm honest with you, and um, at the end of the day, only you will ever know what you need to achieve and do, and whatever you go through is as, as part of your own process and journey. Um, 
and I wish everyone the best here. But I'll let you go ahead and talk to them about the technical aspects. All right, cool. So, uh, yeah, like I said, we're gonna go into uh, some technicalities right now. I hope you guys don't find it too boring. However, we feel like um, going over some fundamentals is um, always good. And you guys mentioned that you don't wanna do music. However, many of you do film and stuff like that. Um, and, and this knowledge is really applicable to any um, kind of situation where you're gonna have to use equipment like audio interfaces and stuff like that. So um, to cut you some time and, and make things short, um, it's good to go over those foundations. Even if, you, um, if, even if you're a little bit more advanced, it's always good to um, kind of recap the knowledge. So um, to begin with, we're, we're gonna go through some main connections um, and, and some cables you're gonna see in the studio um, and what situ situations to use them. The, the first one is um, probably one of the most common types of cables you see in the studio. It's a microphone cable, also known as an XLR cable. Um, it's not just for microphone, just to clarify. Uh, it's, it has that second name because pretty much all of the microphones will have that kind of input for that kind of microphone. However, um, you can send all your signal through that um, kind of cable and you'll see that a lot of uh, different effects um, um, or whatever, um, some, some consoles, uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of uh, those, those inputs. So um, the main thing to, to keep in mind about this cable is it's a, it's a balanced cable, and then I'll explain a little bit later what balanced and unbalanced is, but it's just um, a balanced cable will, will give you a little bit more clear signal. Um, so it, it is important to plug in the right one because you don't want to have some interference and some, some noise um, when you're trying to get you know, a nice clear audio. Uh, the number two and number three, I'm sure many of you saw number two. Um, it's the same, actually it's the same type of cable as number three, it's just the size is, is the difference. That's a 3.5 millimeter jack and that's a quarter inch um, jack. This is also known as aux cable. So if you need to plug in your uh, phone into uh, laptop or something like that, like you use that kind of cable. Um, and it's, it's smaller because it's just easier for, for personal use to have that kind of small cable rather than a big one. Whereas in the studio, you don't really want to have, you know, small, tiny cables which are easily uh, bendable and stuff like that. So um, you, you'll see in the studio mainly number one and number three. Those are the type of cables you're going to be dealing with. Um, number four, um, is an optical cable. It works a little bit differently than all the other ones because, uh, you know, like an XLR cable is sending an electrical signal through that cable, uh, whereas the optical cable is actually sending a, a light that carries the information um, inside the cable. Um, number five is a, is a um, RCA, RCA cable. Um, so you, you'll see that cable these days, mostly uh, it's used for DJ decks to plug in turntables into a mixer. So also the name of it is uh, it's a phono cable. Um, and number six and seven, we just throw it in here. Um, these are multi-pin ca cables. You'll see various different ones. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes and uh, they could be used to plug up almost like anything, like a mixing desk, or um, this one is most likely a cable that connects something that's called the stage box, which is basically like a big box in your studio where you plug in all the cables just to have it a little bit more organized. You don't want to have a bunch of cables running through the studio, so you plug it into one box and that goes into your computer, audio interface, whatever. Um, but like I said before, the most common, type of common types of cables you'll find in the studio is number one and number three. So now, um, the, the concept of balanced and unbalanced cable. Um, it's, uh, it's important to use the right one. Um, those two cables, seemingly the same, um, they're, they're actually quite different because the one on the top um, is unbalanced and the one on the bottom is balanced. The only difference that there is is just that one little line on the bottom and uh, that that cable is also known as TS, which is tip, tip sleeve, and the other one is tip, ring sleeve. 
So, um, like I said earlier, it's just a, it's just a way to have a, a clearer signal. The uh, unbalanced cable is usually going to have, uh, well, not usually, it's always going to have two conductors, um, one positive, one negative, and then the um, the ground is in the in the negative conduct the conductor, whereas the whereas the balance cable will always have three conductors, which is positive, negative, and the ground, which allows you to have a more clear signal without interference. Um, mixing board, unfortunately, this is not our studio, so let's not get too excited. Um, this is uh, something that many of us saw in movies and pictures. Um, plus, it'd be even in person if you guys have been in some sort of a recording studio. It's much, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and pretty much this is uh, where like the cables that we've been talking about in the back, like they'll connect in and out. Um, there's also different types of uh, mixing consoles. You have an inline, a hybrid, and a split. So the difference between that is an inline console. The monitor and the input comes into one thing, and the, hence uh, the importance of having uh, a balanced cable because you don't want to have noise. So that's that's really the main reason why you do it. Um, and the split is when you have uh, two a uh, mixing board and it's split into two, so you'll have the return channel. And uh, for instance, in like I said, in the back of the, the mixing board, you'll have uh, inputs like RCAs, like XLRs. So it's important to always use the the, the right cable for a specific piece of equipment. And you know, look, looking at, at this piece of equipment looks a little bit intimidating, but in fact, um, see those, those strips, each of this strip is called a channel, and they're basically copied in, uh, over, you know, across the whole mixing board. So really, if you know one of those strips, you'll know the whole mixing board, apart from that, uh, that uh, middle point where that's like, the, you know, the whole uh, control center, but everything else here, um, it repeats over um, the whole mixing board. So you'll find anything from gain knobs, which is, gain is basically, um, it, 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 it's to increase the, the signal level. Um, we'll explain more about uh, each of those things a little bit later. Um, but yeah, does anyone know maybe what this is? So uh, sometimes, you know, we come across a question um, uh, how, how they used to record music back in the day before computers. Because um, now everything is, you know, it just kind of appears in front of our eyes on the computer, it comes out of speakers, but how did it happen before all the technology came in? And um, this is basically, what, what, what you see here, this computer and audio interface, you could technically um, say that, that this, is, this, is, this is that because um, back in the day, the music would be recorded onto, onto a tape. So, um, and, you know, in, instead of sending it to, 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 the, um, to your computer as, as the final, final audio, it would be sent to this tape machine. And um, it, everything was way more manual back in the day, you know. Today, um, it's so easy to do some, some editing um, in the software, all you have to do is just a press, press button or command C, command V. And back in the day, was, there was no such thing as um, copy and paste. So um, if, you, if someone recorded uh, over, over a song that's already, almost already finished and um, they made a mistake, well, that mistake is going to be in that song. So you either go with it and you just accept this mistake as part of the song or um, or you have to actually grab the tape, cut it, you know, and glue it back together. So it was a very laboring task. Um, here you can see um, one, one of the ways to route a recording studio. Um, and what, what you see here is exactly um, what you will have in your computer. And what I mean by that is all the principles that um, and all the, all the rules that, that you know, th those softwares are based on, they are based on a very traditional um, setup. Uh, so, sorry. Go ahead. You can hear him, though? Yeah. Okay. 
So yeah, pretty, pretty much, uh, uh, again, everything that you see here is just a digital representation of what you get in a mixing board. Um, um, yeah, so this is, this is the audio interface. The one on the bottom, we brought it with us today, and um, the, the one on top is probably the most simple and most cheapest uh, um, audio interface that you can get, and really, they're, they're the same thing. They do exactly the same thing. You have pre-amplifiers that uh, amplify your, your microphone, um, and uh, the, one, the one that we have with us today is called Apollo X8, and it, um, it has eight inputs altogether. However, only four of them are for the microphone. Um, oh, yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah, so we're just gonna quickly go over some types of microphones. Um, we'll, we'll show you some, uh, some, some different um, some, 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 some different uh, pol polar patterns, which is basically an area in which the microphone picks up the sound the most. Um, dynamic microphones, these are microphones that are most common um, in studio situations, in live situations. Um, they're quite um, good with loud sounds, so you'll see them a lot in live situations. They're quite durable as well, so you know, if, you, if you drop that kind of microphone, it's not gonna break that easily as, um, as other ones. And um, yeah, the, the middle microphone, I'm sure some of you saw um, this mic uh, watching a podcast or something like that. And these days it's, it's commonly known as a podcast microphone, but it's actually very good for vocals as well. And Michael Jackson himself recorded Thriller on this, on this microphone. It's quite cheap as well, so it's affordable if you're starting your journey with music. Um, yeah, um, these are, condenser microphones, large diaphragm condenser microphones. And this is the, the first one is the one that we brought with us today. Um, they're, they're a little bit different uh, in the way they work. Uh, they have a diaphragm, which is a, a thin membrane, which reacts to sound pressures. And you know that microphone creates an electrical signal that travels through the, the cable. It, it, those microphones, they tend to be quite fragile, so you have to be very careful um, handling them. The one in the middle, uh, it's an industry standard microphone. That's the one that we have in our studio, and we've already managed to break one of these, even though we were trying very hard not to. So yeah, something to keep in mind. Uh, small diaphragm condenser microphones are, uh, they work in a similar um, fashion, and they're, they're great for um, recording um, classical instruments, you'll see them a lot recording, you know, orchestras and stuff like that. They tend to have a very natural um, sound, so um, yeah, great for, great, great for instruments. You'll also see um, them in an overhead setup, which is, uh, I don't know if you guys saw, so you have a drum set that's being recorded. Um, you have those, those two microphones on the top that are facing the drum set. These are called, called overheads, and they usually come as pencil microphones. And um, you mentioned the 48 volts. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so also a very important thing about condenser microphones is that they require a power, um, a power supply. So the dynamic microphones, you just kind of plug them in to your audio interface and they, they work. Whereas this one, it requires some sort of uh, powering. Either they come with like a big external uh, power, power box or um, they use something called 48 volts, yeah? And that's quite important. When you plug it, your microphone into your audio interface, some of them, they might not be working. You're wondering why. Well, that's because they require uh, some, some power, some, a little kick to it. So yeah, you just turn on 48 volts, and it's a way to send a DC electrical signal through the cable to power up your, your microphone. Um, yeah, sure. Okay, so polar, uh, polar pattern. Uh, like I mentioned before, polar patterns are, it's an, it's an area in, in which the microphone is most sensitive to. And it is quite important to roughly know what your polar pattern is when, when you're um, giving a speech, playing uh, a live gig, or even you know, recording in the studio. Um, it's like this bubble around the microphone and um, Obviously, this microphone is face face like that. So if 
if that was the case, the, the bubble would be like literally here. And it's, um, every microphone comes with, uh, with a manual, and in this manual you see something that's like this, this two-dimensional um, diagram which, which shows you what kind of color pattern it is. And you kind of have to think about it in, in 3D, obviously. Um, you know, the, the front of the microphone picks up the sound the most in this case, whereas the back of it, uh, you know, 180 degrees, it, uh, it doesn't pick up the sound. Uh, you know, it's, it's out of the polar pattern, basically, of, of that microphone. And there are different polar patterns that we see um, in, in, in the microphones. Um, so let's let's go through through some of them because, like I said, it's it's important to use the right one. You might cause some 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 problems uh, if you if you don't. Like um, the first one, for instance, it's the it's, it's an omnidirectional polar pattern. Um, the the line in the middle, that's your microphone. Think of this as your microphone. Now, um, the area around it is is the area in which the microphone picks up the sound the most and. In this case, it's a, it's a circle on that diagram. However, it's a 2D representation of, of a 3D situation. So in, in real life, that would be actually a sphere around the microphone. So an omnidirectional polar pattern would, would just allow you to record sound from, from any angle. So it's a natural choice if you had like a choir or something like that, a couple of people um, trying to record one part, you'd place them around the microphone and switch omnidirectional pattern, and bang, you are able to record sound equally from every angle. Um, number two, three, and four are what's, what's called cardioid polar pattern, and because of the shape, as you can see, you know, it has that heart-like shape. And um, we saw, you saw it in the previous slide. The, the number two, um, it picks up the sound best from the front of the microphone, so it's very good. Uh, when it comes to blending out background. Um, if you, for instance, have a, a monitor, if you're playing on stage um, and you have a monitor uh, in front of you so you can hear yourself, that microphone would work well in that kind of situation because it would not pick up anything in front of it. It wouldn't pick up that monitor so there wouldn't be any feedback from it. Um, number three and four, number three is uh, what's called super cardioid polar pattern. And it's very similar, however, it has a slightly more narrow angle of pickup, and uh, so it, it blends out uh, sides a little bit more. So if you have um, some instrument playing right next to you, it would be a good choice to use that kind of microphone, uh, probably better than number two, because number two is a little bit wider. Um, yeah, because, because it's, it's always good to remember some of those rules, because it's a little bit more narrow to pick up, uh, angle that the user has to maintain a little bit more uh, consistent position in front of the microphone. If you just start moving your head left and right, it might pick up those sounds a little bit less when it comes to that kind of microphone. And um, see this, this, this part behind the microphone, it suggests that the microphone picks up the sound a little bit from the back as well. So. Uh, yeah, like I said, if you, if you have a monitor right in front of you, if you stand very close to the monitor, you might experience some feedback, and you're wondering why? Well, maybe it's because your microphone is also picking up the sound from the front. Uh, number four, also very similar. However, uh, the, the, the angle is even more narrow, picks up even more sound from, from the back. Um, number five is... Uh, uh, subcardioid uh, polar pattern, and it's uh, you know it's good. It's also very good for recording multiple instruments. Um, it's slightly uh, more directional than the, the number two than the cardioid one, but less than than omnidirectional, which is which is you know it just picks up sound from from every angle. Um, those types of microphones, they're also uh, they have less of something that's called proximity effect. And what pro proximity effect is, uh, basically the closer you get to the microphone, the more um, of the low frequencies you will hear, the more bass you will hear in your, in your voice. 
And it could be a good or a bad thing. Like, for instance, radio broadcasters, they've been using that kind of effect for, for years in order to make the sound a little bit more full when they speak on the radio. So they get quite close to those microphones and it makes that, uh, you know, that boomy, boomy sound. But sometimes you, not wanna, uh, sometimes you might not want to have it. So it's, it's something to, to keep, keep in mind, you know, uh, that the proximity effect. Um, number six, figure of eight is uh, basically means that the sound will be picked up on one side of the microphone and on the other one, uh, on the other side it will not, it, it, will, it will also sorry, pick up the sound. So if you have two people um, trying to record a part, like a natural choice would be to um, choose a figure of eight. And sometimes you might wonder like, okay, so why don't we just choose um, number one in all situations, just let's just record uh, the sound from every angle. Well, sometimes you just wanna, maybe you just wanna record two people. You don't wanna have any uh, sound coming from, from the sides. You wanna blend mm -hmm. out the room. You don't wanna hear the room. You just wanna hear two people. That's why you would use the figure of eight. And uh, should, we, should we demonstrate some of the, some yeah. of the patterns? Hmm? No? I think we will go into, into Pro Yeah? Okay. Yeah. I think with any of these things, I know that it's a recording studio and a lot of the technicals that might not match what you want to do and, or you might not necessarily need to take some of this info in, but you really need to translate it to what you're doing. The same way when you're painting something with watercolor, you're not going to use just any piece of paper. The same way with all these techniques and different mic signals and processes, you just have to translate it to what you do. Because even everything, design is everywhere, even in, even in the way the layout is or like how you were showing you the different mics, polarities, they all have a, a figure to them. They all have some sort of design and pattern that you just have to own in and, and figure it out. Same way with animals. Cheetahs have prints. You know, same snakes have, have, have scales. Like there's always something you can take away from things and translate it into your work, into how you design or see your art. Art is everywhere, right? And I, and I think the, the important thing, the reason why we're saying these things is, again, like I said, the, the, the main thing is that you have a strong foundation because We'll, we can go into, for instance, into project files and stuff like that, but then it's like we're speaking to maybe people that won't understand. It's like you guys speaking to us about video. Like, I don't know anything about video besides, like, sample rate, for instance. So that's the importance of just having some form of an idea. Um, and it's, uh, I just want to say, it's, it's really an art form, you know, recording music and mixing it. Me, myself, um, when I started my journey with music, I thought that you just plug in a microphone, you record something, and, and it comes out nice of the out of the speakers, but as soon as I started recording music, I was just like, why did it sound like this? It's so bad, and then I found out there's a whole art form behind it, you know, mixing and, and tweaking all those settings so that, you know, the, the sound is more, most pleasant to the ears. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be over, going over some examples, some effects, um, some more cool stuff right now, hopefully for you guys. Um, so Sultan, we're gonna take over right now. Yeah, so I'm going to be speaking about um, audio mixing. So what's audio mixing is uh, when an engineer uses things such as distor uh, distortion, compression, EQ to make it more listenable. Um, and the, the main points that I'm going to go through is th things such as buses and auxiliaries. Um, so in, on this project, uh, well, it's not even a project, it's just a drum pad. Uh, did you hear from the back? Very cool. So, the, the first thing I'm going to speak about are EQs. So what an EQ is, it's a, it used to be a, a hardware piece of equipment, which is obviously digital now, and what it represents is in this situation. It just shows you the frequency range um, of, a, what's it called, of a specific instrument. So in this case, I have all the drums, and, uh, and I've just grouped them. Uh, so yeah, as you can see, with an EQ, uh, with an EQ, you have things like low cut, uh, high cut, you have shelf, notch, and what these th what, uh, what these things do are, for instance, they shape the audio file. So for instance, if I'm uh, if I would just play the the drums. Uh, And I like remove it, you only hear like the highest, for instance. This is very important for like, again, things such as like vocals, like you have frequencies that you don't want 
um, you know, you remove them because as the process goes further and further, what you'll end up having is like, you know, a muddy mix. So, you know, cutting, uh, cutting highs or um, cutting lows is very important. Um, the next thing I'm going to speak about is uh, a compressor. So, you know, you have different type of compressors. Uh, let me go. Well, I'm, I'm going to speak about is the, what's the LA-2A. And if you can see below, this is a, um, an opto compressor. What this means that it just uh, uses like uh, light the input of uh, how much of the light is going and compresses it based of how bright or how dull it is. Um, so ma mainly uh, compressors have threshold, ratio, attack, release, and this is just how the compressor essentially works. So for instance, this is, so for instance here, you'll have, uh, on this one you'll have attack, release, and again, uh, the, the, main, the main difference is like the attack, like threshold is like, for instance, when the compressor is working, attack and releases, how the compressor is working, ratios, the strength. Um, and those are just things to bear in mind. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because it can become like a rabbit hole because everything is kind of has a relationship uh, with one another. Um, so as far as distortion, um, again, you have different types of distortions. Uh, you know, before again, you'd have to have hardware equipment. So everything that you actually see on screen would be a physical form. And obviously, like uh, now we have the digital world, and you know, for instance, we have a different type of uh, saturation uh, plugins. And again, they they do similar things, but like uh, the the deeper you, that you get into music, you're gonna like find out that they have like a different color. Uh, and, you know, they'll do cer certain things. Um, for instance, uh, when I talk about digital, you're probably thinking like, oh, what, what do you mean by digital and this? Like I said, you're gonna, if you have like a tape saturation, if you have an overdrive or a clip uh, distortion, you have to have different racks. Uh, with today, So like uh, today, you, you will be able to, like in the digital world, you'll be actually a, uh, choose what kind of uh, like saturation, uh, oh my God, sorry, not my computer. But yeah, so like you'll, you'll be able to choose between like the different saturations, the different uh, types of distortion that you want. And what, again, what it allows you to do is like, uh, for instance, give character to your uh, instrument. Um, Do you, guys, do you guys know what, uh, what distortion is when it comes to music? Um, you know electric guitar, right? The, the harsh sound of an electric guitar. The, the, the way it uh, produces that harsh sound, there's something that I mentioned before called gain, right? It increases the, the level of the, of the signal. So the way the, the guitar amplifier works, um, it uses that gain, uh, and gain really is kind of volume as well, because it does increase the volume of the, um, of, of the sound. However, there is a slight difference, because gain, it's, it's, it's increasing the level before uh, processing, and volume is increasing the, uh, the level um, after processing. What I mean by that is so how, how an electric guitar would work. They would crank up this gain um, to increase the level of the signal and make the guitar distorted, you know, create the overdrive, that harsh sound, and then vol overall, overall volume of everything would be turned down, so you know the the the, the sound level is uh, you know is it, it can be listenable. Um, so that that's that's how how distortion is made, for instance, for guitar. I can change computers as well to open up a project because uh, it, it would it would be much easier as well. So. Uh, Sorry, guys. You know, we we wanted to have um, our main computer. We brought it with us uh, from from the studio, but there was a little bit of a technical um, issue, and we couldn't um, connect it to the to the main um, screen. So now we just 
kind of have to go back and forth between two computers. So that's uh, you know part of part of the whole thing, technical issues. And you will find that a lot in the studio. So that's why we're trying to you know give you some of this information because it could save you um, a little bit of time um, in, uh, in in a studio situation where where you know you might be uh, you might be you know you might have a little bit of time you might have a little time um, you're rushing things so um, yeah. So the project I'm opening now is actually going to be Arian. Where is Arian? Yeah. Uh, so you guys can kind of see, Are you, gonna, um, you know, uh, the plug. Like for instance, I can go through. I can go through the plugins so you guys have an idea. Because I think it's e easier to visually show you guys. Otherwise, you're probably sitting there and thinking, like, what is this guy talking about? Um, but yeah. So just give me a moment. The output. So, so in preferences, uh, you can choose in and out. And um, for instance, in that in that case, um, for, for in, we're going to choose our audio interface. That's where the sound is going to be going into. And then for output, we're choosing AZMI, which is going into you know uh, the speakers. And, So yeah, this is um, what I'm just going to do. I'm going to play, um, for instance, what it sound like if you didn't have like these plugins. Involved sound. What I'm going to do now is just remove everything so you guys can hear the before and after. Would you that I loved you? Would you stay there by my side? Stick around and tell me that you tried. Would you ever lie? Would you jump into my ride? Would you slide? Would you tell me that you fight for me? My so that, for instance, that, that's just uh, raw. That's, uh, that, that's what you get, for instance, when you just go on the mic. With, with myself, for instance, I used to think that you go into a mic, you record, and everything is done there for you. Um, so this is uh, the A and B. It's like a little Stick bit more level, there'll be tried. some reverb, I'm not sure if you, you guys hear in the back, right? yeah, so yeah, like, so yeah, like, like I was saying before, uh, you know, it's uh, important to, you know, know uh, how to use certain plugins, and that's the whole purpose of you know, uh, things like distortion, auto-tune, compression, delay, is to uh, make uh, the, what's, uh, the listening process more exciting, I, I guess. Um, so did any, anyone have any uh, questions or like something that you, you guys might uh, want to ask us? I think that would be also easier. Um, this one's Logic Pro. Um, but what's it called? We use, you know, Pro Tools, Logic, Ableton. I, my prefer preference is uh, Logic, Pro Tools, and Machine. That's that's what I like to use the most. Okay. Uh, how much are you going to pay me? I'm joking, I'm joking. Uh, we, uh, so 30 per hour for uh, no mixing, and we go through hardware equipment, and then 40 per hour uh, mixing. 
and uh, the ad additional fees like mastering and stuff like that. So yeah. Yeah, so what's it called? The, it, it came from my own pocket and mainly, you know, we, we had like certain understandings, certain people had to take roles as well. So, you know, obviously certain people put in more than others and so on, but it, there is like a role, each person has a role and, you, you know, benefits. Because for instance, if you open a studio but you don't have the right people as well, then it's like kind of pointless, you know, even spending the money. Yeah, yeah. like Sultan said, we, we all had our roles and, um, you know, I had, opportunity to um, find, find the builders, find the materials. Um, we've been all preparing for this um, home move for, for a little bit, so we've been saving up quite a lot. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just like little bits here and there. Like I said, try and cut the cost as much as possible, even if it um, comes down to um, getting the materials from, from like other countries maybe even. Um, we had to wait for certain things um, quite a long time because of that. Um, however, you know, long, long term it was worth it 100% because it just saved us a lot of money. Mm. And we were stagnant for a year as well. Like, oh, we, we literally had, because of COVID, we just had to just wait it out for, yeah. for a while. And we actually got very lucky with COVID relief grants and, and there, was, there was different processes that helped us go get through a whole year of like yeah. not being able to be in that building. Um, cool. I, uh, my guy over there wants to ask a question. What do you want to ask? Raise, yeah. Say that again? Uh, yeah. Well, do you want to through a project or do you want to hear through, I can go on Spotify and play or do you want to see the project or like how, how would you? Well, first of all, I'm going to let y'all know now. I like hip hop music, so I'm going. I'm going to play uh, some hip hop. That's that's what I like making the most, anyway. Um, so I'm not. I'm not necessarily an artist, but uh, you guys probably heard of like DJ Khaled and like Metro and stuff like that. So that's the type of approach that I take uh, towards my artistry. So although I'm not the artist, I'll uh, push certain tracks out as an artist. So, um, so, um, like, for instance, this is a full production, so, uh, myself, Lucas, I agree, we got him. So from the piano, kicks, snares, things like that. You trying to run up a bag right now? So it's Genji. There's some inspiration you can listen to. I just came from Vegas with some different views. See this Genji flavors irresistible. They know this Genji flavors irresistible. Keep a face on me cause it's critical. I got bait thrillers in the zoo. Tell her hey, yeah, he could get a clue. Tell her hey, yeah, he can get a clue. Remember days when they try to ridicule Now it's hey, hello me, no look at you On the way, tell me what you been up to Been the same since middle school Now my chains looking like they river blue And my rings do the chicken noodle soup Yeah, I don't want to play the whole. Play, play, thing, uh, so. play um, just so they see also the instrument. We, we record, you know, different instruments. I'm playing guitar myself. Play Riddler and uh, Maisie. Uh, what's your name? Have you? I don't have Spotify. I can bleed on that. So yeah, Lucas also plays the guitar and stuff like that. So you know, that's where we complement each other. Like I wouldn't say I'm necessarily a musician, but I can play keys and stuff. But um, you know. Uh, he, he, he helps me out, out a lot as well in the uh, more musical side of it, as a music theory and stuff like that. So this is Lucas on the guitar. Make me dead tight 
My baby, I don't fish out for real. You know how I feel. You know, say, you don't feel dead. Bacon for them. Uh-huh. I'll be cussing at you. I'll take my two dice and I'll you. I'll be one show to my feet. Uh-huh. I'll take my four for you. I'll take my two. Girl, I got to tell for you. And I'll go make you know it's my day. So, baby, you want you. And again, you know, there's, it's not just recording the guitar and, you know, it comes out of that. There's quite a bit of like mixing and tweaking the sounds, depending on what kind of sound you want to achieve, um, what kind of track you're, you're working with. Uh, but, you know, we, we do the full production in our studio um, from, from making a beat to recording guitar, mixing and mastering. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, say, uh, say that again. What's the learning curve of what? Uh, is, this, is this better? Yeah. Uh, what's the learning curve like um, in terms of just creating maybe an ambient sound and maybe mixing a voice over for like an overlay on a video or something like that? For, uh, mixing it for, sorry, what? Like just making an ambient sound and like adding oh. a voice maybe for like an overlay. Well, um, for creating, um, so there are, yeah, there are various techniques, but you'd, you know, you'd use a lot of um, reverberation, so what we can hear in this room is reverberation sounds reflecting off of, um, uh, off of, off of the walls and, and everything um, nowadays is also in a box in, in, in a computer. So you'd use reverbs and delays, and delay is really a, a, a reverb, but just a, a longer one. And, um, yeah, and uh, like, you know, I think like uh, with something like that as well, it's kind of like subjective because I, I won't, for instance, sit in front of a screen and be like, this is what I'm going to do first. So it's like, maybe like uh, with you, I'm pretty sure like whenever you're editing and stuff like that, you know, you might have a different approach one day to another day. So it's just kind of like a creative process. A lot of the time, honestly, like you end up sitting in front of the screen for probably two hours and then, you know, you'll be putting different things on and like that's kind of the creative process it's like it's like being a painter and having different brushes you might use this one day and this another time so yeah it kind of just depends would you say that um the software that you've shown us might be like overkill maybe for creating just like ambient sorry say that, i couldn't hear you sorry say it again would you say that maybe oh this is a little better would you say that maybe um uh, the software that you've shown us might be overkill perhaps for creating just like an ambient sound for a video like, um, do we need yes and that no level yes and i think it's good to be able to do as much as you can with the least that you can but then if you have like the whole toolbox why like what's the problem with having the whole toolbox yeah that, that, that okay, that's, I, mean, I don't i don't think it's overkill i think like, it's good yeah. if you have more tools that i guess that's what i'm yeah, saying okay i'm just saying from the perspective of not having ever dabbled in that at all so maybe coming oh, from that okay, point okay. Of yeah, it can, zero knowledge yeah it seems it, very uh, overwhelming yeah 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 exactly and i think i think that's why it's important to learn like the foundations of like the basics of certain things because then it become like you it'll be a much clearer view rather than just opening logic and then being like okay i'm gonna create right. but that's not there's nothing wrong with doing that either man like you know everyone has it starts from somewhere thank you Um, are there any tips or like tricks that you wish you knew about Logic for, for yes, a hundred percent? So I think the, the the first thing for me would be uh, I'm, you get CPU overload on your computer often. CPU over like when when you have a lot of channels and stuff oh, like that. Yeah. You get yeah. that? Okay, cool. See, so for instance, when I like when I first started, I ended up just command D command, so it just it, it duplicated everything, and what that ends up happening is kills your CPU. Um, and once I learned things of like buzzing, buzzing and auxiliaries, uh, I was like, oh, okay, this can save a lot of time, give you more control. And what, uh, do you, do you, are you familiar with buses and auxiliaries by any chance? No, I'm not. 
So, for instance, um, do you want me to go through it or? Uh, I don't mind. You can okay. Just so, like, uh, it's like so a bus is just something where you send the final sound and you group it, and an auxiliary is a duplicate of that sound. Yeah. And once I learned that, for instance, those two things, it like helped my workflow, made uh, made me more comfortable, made it easier on my computer because, like, if you have three different vocals and they're punching in at different times. Mm. It allows you to like not have to put auto-tune in every single channel and like things like that help a lot, yeah. especially if your mixes gets like more complicated and stuff like that. Right. Yes, sir. Uh, there's no sirs. <clears throat> there's no sir. We're like completely horizontal as okay. an institution, yeah. And this particularly, it's all about wisdom coming from uh, the audience as well. But I'm just curious about you going to, to, to work in, a, in your day, you know, and if you look forward to, uh, to your each day of going to work. You look forward, like when you get up, you're like, yes, I'm going to the studio today. Uh, so a sense of yeah. camaraderie. <laughs> it, you know, I, I don't... It, it's not, it's not always like that because you know, you're not going to be going all happy and cheerful to every session. I mean, there are certain types of generous or, you know, genres of music, genres of music that um, you might not like or you might not like the workflow of that person that you're dealing with. So it's, it's not always that. Plus, you know, we started as, it was, started as a passion and now it's becoming more of a job, and um, it's, it's always going to be our passion, but it, it is kind of something that we do to, to make a living, so it's not always going to be 100, you know, passionate, 100% uh, passionate. Yeah, like with me, I'll be real with you, I prefer sessions that, like, there's no money involved, like, obviously, if I have to make money and stuff like that, and that's the whole point, right, you're making money from your passion, but I end, end up enjoying the work that I do that doesn't involve money and I'm just working with people. So yeah, I think it is very much up and down, yeah. Um, do you ever get disagreement with some of, of your clients? Sorry, say that again? Do you ever get any disagreement with some of your clients? Yes, a lot. <laughs> How do you sort them out? Huh? How do you sort, sort them out? If possible. <laughs> yeah. No, like, I guess it's like uh, disagreements. I, I guess, like, if it comes down to the music, it's not that serious. Sometimes I, I, I find that the disagreements that I get with is certain people's attitudes, really, in the studio. So, like, when they walk in, like, they feel like they can sit on the glass table or they can just sit on, you know, because it's not their, it's not their gear, it's not their equipment. So, like, when it comes down to the music, at the end of the day, you know, if they're paying me, if something sounds good and they say, no, it doesn't sound good, can you change it? And what they have sounds terrible. I'm gonna put what they sounds as terrible because they're paying for it. That's why I say like it, it, it comes down to you know like you doing your job as well. Sometimes that can be quite difficult. Well, if, at the beginning, uh, especially if you, if you're just starting to get paid for work and stuff like that. Because I only started getting paid for this like four or five years ago, and I've done music for like 11 years. So yeah, like it, it just depends. Plus, like a disagreement, like it's just a communication problem. At the end of the day, you, you, there's no need for disagreement. If your communication is going is okay. At the end of the day, if someone has a preference towards something, it's just about communicating why they think that, and just finding the medium ground between that. And the client can always be right, but at the end of the day, they can always they can also be wrong, and it, it's it's not wrong to point that out to them, but they need to understand why they're wrong and what 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 what's what. It's not even necessarily wrong. What makes their thinking not correct in, in the process of making music and especially when working with an engineer that knows his craft, you're paying him to, to you, you're trusting him to do it. That's why they're paying you at the end of the day. They want you to make decisions and not just listen to them and say yes and, and accept their point of view. So, yeah. um, where are you guys located, like your studio? Sorry, say that again? Where is your studio located? It's in North Acton on the Central Line. We're based in Park Royal, which is one of the newest uh, design districts in London. Um, it's, it's an up-and-coming area for sure because they're, they're really building around it at the moment and making different hubs and communities. It's, it's really industrial in the sense that there's loads of factories and uh, other businesses there like metal welding factories and, and our place is called Excelsior Studios. It houses different businesses, painters, uh, different textile makers, like you, literally you have everything, podcast studios there. It's really, really a big hub 
you could just run a whole business there. Like even when we got artists that come there, it's easy to introduce them to people that do printing or do, do clothing or merchandise. And yeah, it's, it's one big hub community. Yeah. Last question. Um, is your studio slash business, is it more expensive than your actual personal life? Uh, more expensive than our personal yeah. life. Man, it's not all like roses and flowers at the end of the day. Like, it's not, as much as it's a recording studio, like, you gotta understand that we actively have to go out there and put ourselves on people's radars. You know, we, it's a, every day is a journey of how do we approach a new potential client or, and like, even that thinking can really blockade you because it's like, if you consistently think of it as just a clientele and client base, it's like, you're really not gonna reach the core of it, which is like, what is, what is it that you're trying to do? We're, we wanna be an entertainment studio at the end of the day. A recording studio is just a shell. Is where things get recorded. But at the end of the day, we want to be in post-production houses, we want to be in TV, we want to be in film. That's why we, we I used to work for a post-production house called Absolute Post in Soho, in Sydney, uh, Poland Street. And um, yeah, that, that's what opened up my avenues to certain people that I know and that I know in film. So we do utilize people that we already know, but a lot of it is reaching out to, you know, like law firms, corporate clients, like everyone needs to record something. Like music isn't just like, let's record vocals. It's like, let's create a jingle. We, we just come off the back of the project for Kusoma where um, I wrote some of the music for, for the kids to sing. He, he writes the music for every single episode, literally off the bat and just uh, records all the piano to some of the music. Same, same way when you watch Friends, you have that the intro music and some of the guitar rhythm straight into the episode. Like that's, that's what people look for. They look for different little, little niches and skill sets. And, that's what, when, when we're trying to like advertise and, and market and, and, and point people towards us, it's like, A, we've got, we got the youth behind us and the people that come to the studio and their stories and B, our skill sets and, and melodies that we like to play and, and um, yeah. There's so, so many things when it comes to, to running a business. Like the back end is really, yeah, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on, like from social media management to just like to contacting people daily, cold emails, cold messaging, like, uh, there's even things like like Bumble Biz that I utilize. Like I, I utilize like other different sectors where you wouldn't really necessarily look at, but it's like every avenue is explorable. Like every single avenue, even being here today, like, like you never know what happens. You could point us to a new person. You know what I'm saying? There's there's so many different ways of marketing and and, and putting yourself on people's maps. Um, so yeah. I just saw, I wanted to show this uh, project, the, book, the yes. books for, for kids. So and um, yeah, like Arian said, you really need to try and grab every opportunity and just, you know, sometimes you need to keep telling people, do you need something to record, you know? And um, so we, we try and do like literally everything. This is one of the projects that we do. Um, <laughs> Hello. So, like, if you have seen how this session looked like in the beginning, it was just one big mess. We basically let those kids come to the studio and just do their thing, like run around, you know, laugh and say some stuff to the microphone, and then we just basically chopped it up and made it made it a song. But sometimes you just need to let people do what they do, let them in, and you know, then it's our job to make it sound good. Yeah, man. Working with kids is definitely the most difficult part. When I first gave them the lyrics, it was just like, I didn't know what to expect. Within 10 minutes, they knew all the words, and it was just like, cool, let's, let's just throw them in the booth at this point. They, they all went in. It was, yeah, and then when, once you finished engineering, it just sounded like that. It just sounded great. And Francis, who is the, the head behind that project, he's really cool. It's also seeing, like, uh, the fruits of, of it all. Like, at the end of the day, this, the, they might not have had the biggest budget behind this project, but... It was about trying to get involved in a project that has meaning. And I think children's book reading projects are a great thing because there's always going to be people, new, new life on this earth, new, pe new people that are going to grow and become something. So it's like, you know, that's a great place to position yourself in, especially like somewhere where growth is going to happen. And um, yeah, there's always room. Always room there. Um, 
That mic is crazy. <laughs> uh, have you ever rejected a project, and if so, why? Go on, boys. I bet you have. Oh. <laughs> yes, not enough budget. I'm joking. But no, it's, it's sometimes, sometimes you, like, uh, when you have, like, when you're in an interview, or not interview, sorry, sometimes when you're speaking to people or they come to the studio and you have a meeting with them, it's like kind of sometimes, I'm not going to say easy to gauge, but you can kind of tell, like, do you really want to work with this person? Like, you know, certain people have, like, diva personalities or yeah. they have what's it called, you know, they think that they're above certain things. It's like, I don't, I, I don't want to work with that. Yeah, I mean, I, I've rejected okay. working on a song before as well just because it's not, it's not even an ego thing. It's just that sometimes people want control over certain things and, and that's what you're trying to eliminate at the end of the day within the session. That's for me, I, I don't like controlling something so much. It's about freedom and expressing yourself. Um, but the moment it becomes a thing of like, oh, why do you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way, it really, it's just like your inner senses just shut off a bit and it's just like, oh, I don't really want to do that. Hey, um, guys, can we hear this, the uh, Moog? Huh? Can we hear can the, the Moog? Yes. So, I need to change um, the computer again. Open Ableton here again. No, it's one of my Tell them a bit about it, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll plug up the, the you can move jump. and show you, we'll show you one cool trick when it comes to um, music production and, and, and synthesizers and whatnot. Um, basically, there's this thing called MIDI, um, which is, it's, it means musical, um, uh, it's musical instrument digital interface and uh, it's, it's a way to send information um, from your computer uh, to either an external device or, or a plug-in and uh, you really don't even need to know how to play keys because you can just um, you can you can you can create a composition within your software and you can just send that signal into um, like you know either a plug-in some sort of a software external device um, and uh, MIDI information it has it has three things in it. It has the pitch, um, it has velocity, which is how hard the sound is being um, played, and also it has the length of the note. And based on those, based on those three things, you can create a whole um, musical composition. So if you go to the, to the back of um, Moog, for instance, there's, uh, there's MIDI in and there's MIDI out. Um, and in some of the interfaces, you'll see also MIDI in, MIDI out uh, in the back of the inter interface. We unfortunately, we don't have that uh, MIDI in and out, so we have to have a separate box for that. But um, yeah, with, with that, we're able to send a signal uh, from the computer. We're able to send the signal from the computer to Moog, and then uh, we're receiving the actual audio signal back. Um, so, yeah, like I said, you, you really guys can come up as well and like mess around with it. No, but I want to, let, let me do the, the open Ableton. Is Kane getting okay? Yeah, just play that.
So what we're going to do right now is uh, we haven't got many sounds for the Moog. So we're just going to go jump into a project that I just released called LVO. So out on all platforms, Spotify, Apple, iTunes, Tidal, whatever you use. Um, a little promo there, you know, self-promo. Uh, we'll get self and loading it up. And say, Hello. You get this? Testing, testing. So I go by the name of ARX IVN on the stage. My real name is Arion, so it's just an abbreviation of that. Um, yeah, for me, music is, has been an important part of my journey so far, and it's something that I'm going to continue doing. Um, it's okay to be rough in this world. I know this, this presentation started off roughly, but uh, you know, we're human beings. We're diamonds in the rough at the end of the day. It's okay to be a little short edge sometimes. It's not... It's, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, we're all a bit weird, a bit rough around the edges. Go ahead, LVO. Yeah. Stand up by my side, stick around and tell me that you tried. Would you ever slide? Would you tell me that you're right? Would you glide? Would you tell me that you're right for me? July. Told me that you're down on your luck and you find meaning yeah. in ways that I hold you so tight. Yeah. I told you that I love you. Ooh. If I told you that I love you. If I told you that I loved you, would you stay there by my side? Stick around and tell me that you try. Would you ever slide? Would you tell me that you would you slide? Would you tell me that you fight for me, my darling? You know that I would. Yeah. Stay by your side, wish I could. If I told you I loved you, yeah. If I told you, if I told you, if I told you. If I told you that I loved you, would you stay by my side? Stick around and tell me that you try. Would you ever slide? Would you tell me that you're right? Would you slide? Would you tell me that you fight for me, my darling? You know that I would. <laughs> stay by your side, wish I could. There's vocals, baby. <laughs> but time will heal what I feel in my heart. No time will be spent wasted. I feel back on. Oh, oh, oh. It's alright to be rough around the edges, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing's perfect. Just enjoy what you can. Can't control it all. Thank you so much. To end this all, I just want to show you guys something. It's, a, it's an excerpt from a book. It's uh, actually from Feng Shui for interior design. And this is what I mean when everything lends itself to everything and connects itself to everything. Uh, the human labyrinth, the maps inside our minds. Okay. Can you see it up there? You can't see it. I'll read it out. Life is like a tree trunk. A scientist holding his tail may find that life is rope-like. 
a poet feeling an ear may proclaim life like a lotus leaf. A doctor holding his tusk may conclude that life is like a bone. A philosopher grasping his trunk may pronounce life to be like a snake, and so on. From his or her own perspective, each expert's conclusion is knowledge, knowledgeable and makes sense. Their theories, however, are merely parts of the whole picture. And I, too, am one of the blind. And because I touch a different part of the elephant, I have developed my own theory about the relationship of the universe to human life. My insights come from China, a vast and varied country roughly the size of the United States, which during its 5,000 years of civilization has spawned many diverse and deep concepts. Among the most arcane yet practical of these concepts is Feng Shui. According to Feng Shui, our life and destiny are closely interwoven with the workings of the universe and nature. All permutations from cosmic to atomic resonate within us. The force that links man and his surroundings is called Qi, translated as human spirit, energy, or cosmic breath. And there are different kinds of Qi, a kind that circulates in the earth, a kind that circulates in the atmosphere, and a kind that moves within our own bodies. Each of us possess Qi. Qi carries our bodies, yet its characteristics and the ways in which it moves us are different in each and every single one of us. Qi is the breath essential to maintaining physical, environmental, and emotional balance. The point of Feng Shui is to harness and enhance environmental Qi to improve the flow of, with, of Qi within our bodies, thus improving our life and destiny. Harmony and balance are both crucial factors. They pervade the process linking man and the universe, and that process is called Tao. The Chinese link man to heaven and earth through Tao, dividing all things into complementary dualities, yin and yang. Tao is a thread linking humans with their surroundings, be it a dwelling or an office, a mountain or a river, the earth or even the cosmos. Tower works the way. Look at the sky. Is it empty or is it full of atmosphere? Sun, moon and stars. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Out of the sky comes heaven, yang and earth, yin. Within earth exist mountains and plains, yin and rivers, streams, yang. On the mountains and plains, people, yang, live and build houses, yin. There are males, yang, and females, yin. Each has an exterior and interior, yin and yang. Yeah. So, we're complex beings. Whatever problems you're going through, whatever difficulties you may be experiencing, it's all part of your process. It's hard to see sometimes. You know, you may, you may have the worst things going on, but life has a pattern, it pushes us to the most pinnacle point where you might not enjoy it, it might feel uncomfortable, you might be breaking down, it might hurt, you might be crying, but it means that you're being pushed to your absolute pinnacle. Trust the process, trust yourselves, let it all go. Flow with life, baby, flow with life. <laughs> okay. So yeah, so we, uh, I guess a, a round of applause for Stu uh, Connect Studio, first of all. So thanks, guys. Thank you very much, guys. I think, I think it's fair to say we had a, a lot of technical issues today. So, uh, and, and I think that's been like completely uh, almost invisible, I think, to the audience, which is good. So uh, yeah, no thanks for you know, taking your time to come and, uh, and do course, this. And, uh, but basically, these guys have got loads of projects they set up on this machine, which we can't use at the moment, but um, if you're interested, you can maybe... Uh... Yeah, feel free to come up to us, like talk to us, you know, use some of the equipment. Um, you know, we're here for you guys. If you want us to show you some projects, something more, um, yeah, stick around and, and just tell us what, what we can do for you guys. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. And uh, we'll see Recording you is 30 pounds per hour, and mixing is... I'm just taking, I'm just taking the piss. I'm honestly taking it. It's all fine. Thank you. <laughs> Also been told there's um, there's some food that was for a, 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 like some sort of um, event which is outside and if you fancy the food then uh, there's some free food. Yeah. All right, yeah. cheers, guys.